Inuma ilu avilum ublu dulla isbilu shupshika. Shupshik ili kabitma, dulum kabitma achar pshakum. Rabutum anunaku sebetam dullam ushasbilu igigi. Anu abushunu shahu, malikshunu kuradu enlil, kuzalushunu ninota ugalushunu enu. Those were the opening lines of Atrahasis read by Klaus Wilke for the University of London's uh, Department of Languages and Cultures of the Near and Middle East. And it serves as an introduction to a text in a way that reminds us this is a voice from another culture. It's a voice from the past. It's a, a very foreign voice telling a very foreign type of uh, story. And it also reminds us that the form of the story is not necessarily the kind we're used to going to in order to find uh, the contents of a story. We are used to opening a novel, whether it's Harry Potter or Moby Dick, and having a text that was written by one author uh, as a whole. The, the text itself has a beginning, middle, and end. Everything fits together. There's a reason for everything that we read. There's nothing that wanders off. There's no repetitions that, you know, no description of a story that uh, stops and then restarts. Uh, and because of that, when you opened uh, Myths from Mesopotamia and you read Atrahasis, you probably found that this is not what you're used to. This is not what you expect uh, a story to look like. And the reason for that is that this text did not come through the usual sort of process of, of authorship that we're accustomed to. Uh, the, the version you have, most of what uh, you read from Dolly's text comes from an old Babylonian version uh, that was inscribed into clay tablets in cuneiform by someone identifying himself as Ipik Aya. But Ipik Aya was not the author. He did not create this text. Uh, most likely he was uh, a scribe, possibly a scribe in training, someone who was just learning the, to write cuneiform. And the way you learn to write cuneiform is the way you learn to write your alphabet, except cuneiform is a much, much more complicated system of writing because it's not just 26 letters that you have to learn that you can recombine to make uh, a small range of sounds. Uh, it's something that, as I mentioned last time, uh, is evolved from a pictographic uh, script where uh, a word or a letter stands for an entire thing. A letter is a word. Uh, and it, this changes. It starts to take on phonetic sounds so that you could recombine those uh, uh, individual letters standing for sounds, but it's still a much larger uh, range of uh, images that you have to learn to be able to inscribe into a tablet. So the way you do that is by copying somebody else's writing. And you don't just want to copy a, a text of a, a manifest for a, a merchant ship or something like that. That would be boring. You copy a, a story that's enjoyable and a story that's popular. And one of those stories is this story of these three disasters that befall this one person, uh, and this person has help from this uh, from his patron god, Inki or Ea. And uh, it seems that Ipikaya was actually transcribing this as an exercise. And we're going to see later this becomes very important because this is one of the ways that uh, stories like this end up being found all over uh, the, the Middle East. The same story in one or two or three identifiable narrative forms will be found over a wide range of area. The same area where we find cuneiform writing, the, that style of writing, we also tend to find the same stories. So Ipikaya is writing this text, the, the one version, the OBV, the Old Babylonian version that you have in your uh, edition. He's taking this story from somewhere else. He's transcribing it. Uh, he's doing us a great service by preserving it. Uh, and he's also helping us to identify when he's writing. And this is something very few fragments of, of any of the cuneiform texts, unfortunately, do for us. But because he says at the very end of the text that uh, this was written by the hand of Ipik Aya in the month of Ayar in the, the year of Ami Saduka uh, was king, uh, he's telling us that he's writing during the reign of King Ami Saduka. And we have enough court records in cuneiform that we can identify that Ami Saduka was uh, a king during uh, somewhere between 1702 and 1682, uh, before the Common Era BC. So he identifies about when he was writing, and um, he identifies what he has written, the, the physical objects, the tablets that he has written. And this is very helpful because, remember, that these are found all in, in fragments. Uh, the, the cuneiform texts that are fired in clay could potentially last forever. They won't erode, but they are found in collapsed libraries and they're, they're shattered. So we have to 
find the bits and pieces and we never find all the pieces. Like with any, any uh, glass or porcelain or anything you've ever shattered, you know you're never gonna get all the pieces. So he helps us out not only by preserving some text, but even what we've lost from him, we know uh, how many lines might be missing in one place or another because he tells us that he has just completed the third tablet of three tablets. That third tablet has 390 lines on it. All three tablets together have 1,245 lines. So we know when the, the text was written. We know uh, how much, how many lines total would have been in all those uh, tablets. And we have the majority of what he wrote. Uh, and we at least, by having those numbers, know how, how many lines are missing. But as I said, he's not the original author. There are uh, older versions of this uh, text uh, that are just uh, less complete. And they're all a little bit different, and uh, not only different wordings, but sometimes different sequence of events, different names for the, the main character, and that sort of thing. And that's because uh, this story, like most of the stories that we're going to read, in fact, uh, almost all the stories that we're going to read in this class this semester, come from oral tradition. Uh, they're products of writing, but the stories themselves uh, predate the narrative, sometimes by centuries. And we know that... Uh, these types of things happen because there are, have been oral storytellers uh, up to the present day who are able to remember entire epics, you know, things that uh, would, you know, highly frustrate us if we try to remember. Uh, it takes a whole lifetime of training, learning line by line a particular, uh, a particular narrative. And we know that these weren't just recited the way we might recite poetry, but they were sung. Uh, we have the, the, the text themselves uh, show uh, indications of things like musical refrains where the same few passages will be read or you know sung over and over again the way you would not expect in a, in prose uh, you wouldn't really expect in uh, uh, narrative poetry unless it was something that would be uh, like a chorus in a song you like the chorus you want to hear it over and over again you don't actually want to read the same passages over and over again uh, that combined with the fact that we find the lyre uh, l-y-r-e uh, a term for a type of harp uh, we find this uh, in the, the archaeological ex uh, excavations of uh, Mesopotamia, and we find it has a really important place in that culture. The picture below me here on the bottom left uh, is uh, from the Standard of Ur, which is a beautifully designed lapis lazuli work of art that shows you know, a lot of things uh, having to do with life in, in ancient Ur. But one of the things that it features prominently is this guy holding a harp. And you see that the harp has this sort of bull head on the, the front of it. Uh, that dates from uh, a, a thousand years, or uh, almost a, a thousand years, before Ipic Aya writes Atrahasis. Uh, so this is something that is part of this very uh, old culture. Now, we don't know what they were seeing on these harps. We know these harps were very important. They're buried with royalty. Uh, we, they, they're uh, immensely ornate and... and uh, uh, such that we know this is an extremely important object. And that tells us that what it was used for was an extremely important part of Mesopotamian culture. But as you can imagine, in oral tradition, things aren't going to stay the same all the time. Uh, word for word is going to be easier if it's a song. You can remember the lyrics to a song better than you can remember uh, a speech that you have to memorize. But even that's going to change over time. Uh, and perhaps due to that, we have different versions of the Atrahasis story. Uh, about the same time period that Ipigaya is, is writing, and you know a little bit before, uh, we have uh, tablets describing uh, a similar series of events, uh, but the, the main character is named Ziusudra, and he is also the king of Shuropak. He is also uh, a priest of, of Ea, which, remember, is the, the name of Inki in other cultures. So, uh, you know, if you take a look at the map uh, in the background on the bottom right, uh, in Uruk, uh, Inki might be referred to as Ea, whereas in Shuropak he might be referred to as Inki. Uh, the same god, but slightly different stories, slightly different concept of him from one city to, to the next. Well, Zeusudra is probably the same uh, sort of thing. His, his name literally means he of long life in uh, ancient Sumerian. And remember, Sumerians come along before the Akkadians. Uh, uh, Ipik Aya is Akkadian. He's writing the Old Babylonian version of Atrahasis in Akkadian, so it's a, a different language and uh, the names will be a little bit different, uh, but also some of the, the events are a little bit different. And these tablets tell us that there were different stories that weren't just uh, different in time, but they were uh, being carried in slightly different culture. The culture up the river uh, was telling the story slightly differently uh, at the same point in time.
So confronted with all these different versions, we tend to ask, well, which one's the real one? Which is the, the original? Uh, or at least, you know, tr we try to create a composite uh, ourselves. Uh, that's why it's important to go back and remember the difference between a story and a narrative. Uh, the story is the event or the sequence of events that I'm telling about, but my telling is itself the narrative. I am narrating what happened, what happened is the story, what I'm saying or what I'm writing is, is the narrative. And we tend to think of uh, a, a narrative as coming from some original version, either an actual event uh, or at least an original text. And if I think of a text as having an original, like there was one original Atrahasis uh, story, uh, and or one original definitive edition, authoritative edition. That's something we call an Ur text, I'm not in everyday language, but when we're talking about how narratives work. Uh, if I had this idea that there's a single original text that preserves the real or genuine story, and that all later versions derive from that, I'm thinking of an Ur text. But what we find is, however far back we go, however many new pieces of fragments of these tablets we get, we don't get closer to an original, we actually get more diversity. We get more different versions instead of getting closer to a single uh, authoritative one. And so we should actually think of these as, uh, the story at least, as multiform. That is, there's not just one version, uh, there's all these different story elements that the, any individual narrator or writer can choose from in order to tell one iteration of a story. And iteration is another term that will help us sort of figure out how this works. Uh, you know the term reiterate. If I say something over again, I reiterate it. Well, each individual time I say that thing, that is one iteration. So an iteration is one particular narration of a story in a text, a song, a play, a movie, an illustration, or whatever. Sorry to throw more terms at you. I promise the whole semester won't be like this. Once we get this uh, toolbox of, of conceptual uh, uh, terminology down, you'll be able to use that for the text for the rest of the semester, but there's a steep learning curve right here at the beginning. Now, as uh, literary theorist Porter Abbott says when defining narrative as opposed to uh, story, uh, he says, you know, we never see a story directly. We never just know uh, what is happening or what has happened. Uh, instead, we always pick it up through narrative discourse. In other words, other people speaking or writing or singing ab about this thing. The story is always mediated. Uh, mediated meaning s there's some conveyance. Uh, we don't have direct contact to the story. Um, it's coming through media. Uh, media is plural. We use the phrase to, or the, the term to talk about the news media, uh, but that term is plural. It doesn't mean just one news outlet, one newspaper, one news channel. But all of these different sources trying to tell the same story, giving different uh, narrative versions. So the story is always mediated by a voice, a style of writing, camera angles in, in movies, uh, actors' interpretations in movies or on stage. Even when we're watching something, we're still getting it, we're having it framed. Uh, so that what we call a story is really something we construct. Uh, so it's happening in our heads, we're taking different versions, different presentations, trying to put them together to create what we think is the version, but what we're actually doing is creating yet another version in our own heads. But he says, but most stories, if they succeed, that is, if they enjoy an audience or readership, do so because they have, to some extent, successfully controlled the process of story construction. So it's not just a free-for-all. Uh, if uh, you and I hear the same story, we might have slightly different versions of it, but we don't have wildly different versions of it. Uh, in other words, sometimes, uh, we, we see the thing that Frederick Bartlett noticed in the, in the Story of the Ghost uh, uh, lecture. I talked about Frederick Bartlett and his memory experiments. He would have the, the, the Chinook story uh, read to a Cambridge student in Britain, and the Cambridge student would change certain things. Uh, and he says, you know, when a story is passed from one person to another, each man repeating it as he imagines uh, what he has heard from the last narrator, it undergoes many successive changes. Uh, and that much we, we kind of predict. Uh, I tell you a story, you tell somebody else that story, they tell somebody else that story, it changes uh, each time. But, uh, he says, just like uh, the, the definition I just read, uh, at length, it arrives at that relatively fixed form in which it may become current throughout a whole community. So, it eventually sort of stabilizes, it does, doesn't just sort of uh, uh, diverge out of control. But, the important part is within that community. So when you leave the Chinook community uh, in the Bartlett example, and you go into the Cambridge University in, in England um, uh, community, that's when these huge changes take place. Uh, 
Uh, so we have to be sort of aware that when, when a story jumps from one culture to another, it's going to change. Which is why we uh, want to focus on, uh, you know, try to uh, use people within that community uh, as authorities, even if we don't really understand the story we're telling. So, for example, if you take a Native American story, uh, uh, if you have to choose between a version that comes from an anthropologist and a version that comes from another member of that Native community, you want to... Uh, privilege the one uh, of the native community. They're going to and, uh, understand the, the context. They're going to interpret it more like their source is going to interpret these things. Uh, that's the ideal. But what we tend to do is a little bit of both. We take two different sources or 50 different sources uh, of a particular story and we put them together in our own heads, in our imaginations. Uh, when we do this in a text, remember, we'll call this a redaction. When you take, you know, multiple source texts and combine them into one text. But even before we, we actually try to do that, we actually do it in our own heads. Well, I heard this version from, uh, of the, the, the War of the Ghost from a Cambridge student. I heard this version from this uh, Native American writer. And even though I might want to say the, the Native American writer probably knows it better, uh, in my actual memory, they, they tend to kind of converge. I tend to take bits and pieces of, of one and bits and pieces of the other, and I might forget uh, which one uh, was the, the, the source for a particular detail in that text. But that's just a, a natural way we absorb stories. We don't necessarily remember uh, one version from another version from another version. We combine them all into our own uh, versions. And this is what we're going to call, uh, in this class, a myth. Now, the word myth has a lot of different definitions, a lot of different uh, uh, applications. The term, or the, the word myth, comes from the ancient Greek uh, word muthos, which meant more than just what we typically think of. Uh, the myths weren't just about you know, Zeus and the gods and that sort of thing. Uh, one use of it was just a word or a speech or uh, something you say in public, something you say in a conversation, or the thing you talk about, the thing you say, the, the fact that you relate. Not the fact itself, not the object in a scientific sense, but your description of it. So uh, if somebody says, I don't know, but I heard, whatever, and then they tell you something, that's the kind of thing uh, that uh, was typically referred to as muthos, as a myth. Uh, and it's not something that's necessarily false. Like when you know we have the show Mythbusters, uh, we talk about uh, we call something a myth that means that it's false. But it's without the distinction of uh, truth or falsity. Uh, here, I, I don't know for sure, but here's what I've heard. That's that kind of thing. So uh, it might be in, the, in a, the form of a story that's told not uh, something you have to believe exactly as I tell it but also not uh, the assumption that it's wrong, the assumption that there might be some truth to it. Uh, you don't really go beyond that before you just relay this uh, narrative version of a story from one person to another. But of course, in Atrahasis, we have what looks like the, the thing we typically define as myth. That is, we have gods, they're creating the world, uh, they're, they're fighting with each other, uh, and we probably don't assume that there is much truth value in, uh, in this story. We probably don't assume that there, uh, you know, there was an actual god named Elil, and he was, uh, there was a god named Inki or Ea who helped this guy, uh, Atrahasis. Uh, so we look at it, um, frequently people will say things like, uh, uh, art is the lie that tells the truth, or uh, you know, there's truth with a capital T that's that's more universal than facts. Uh, this is actually the kind of thing that would technically classify as a myth. Uh, it's trying to tell some general uh, truth by telling facts that aren't quite right. Um, but then we have these kinds of stories about gods and this sort of thing, and I want to distinguish those from other types of myths. So three more terms. Uh, that will help us distinguish that kind of myth. One is cosmology, and a cosmology isn't necessarily a myth. Uh, the cosmos is the universe. Uh, a Russian cosmonaut is an astronaut. Uh, so cosmos is the world we live in, but the world beyond as well. And it's a concept. It's not the actual universe in this sense. It's a concept of the universe. It's a schema of the universe, how that universe looks. And for the ancient Mesopotamians, the, the universe looks something like the, the picture on the bottom left. Uh, there was the water below the earth, there was the water above the earth, above the ceiling of the sky. That ceiling of the sky was held up by the pillars uh, of these, these tall mountains. 
and above the, uh, you know, there were these gates in the sky that would sometimes allow water in that water tank out that would fall down to the earth, that would be the rain. Uh, that's a schema of how the cosmos is, it's a cosmology. Don't confuse that term cosmology with the term cosmogony or cosmogony. Uh, that G-O-N comes from the, the Greek word genesis, which by the way is a Greek term, uh, which means beginning. So uh, this is the beginning of the cosmos. Uh, in other words, this is a myth dealing with the creation of the world, uh, how the world came to be. And I wanna, that's one type of myth, and I wanna distinguish that from another type of myth, which is called an etiology. Uh, sometimes it's spelled with an A-E-M, that's the way I'm gonna spell it in here. Sometimes it's just spelled with an E at the beginning. But it's a story about the origin, not of the whole cosmos, but of a particular natural phenomenon or a cultural practice. I'll come back to an example of that in a minute. All right, so that's, I know a lot to take in. So take a minute and go over these terms, write them down, especially the red letter terms. Uh, they'll things that you'll need to know for a quiz, but also we'll be applying them to a text. And then when we get to the next video, we'll actually apply those to reading the text of Atrahasis.